right, hello students and welcome to our uh, lecture on ecclesiology for Elam Bible Institute and College. Um, we're going to discuss today the, the characteristics of the Christian church and most of the information, the vast majority of the information that I'll be using today comes from uh, Sojourners and Strangers by Greg R. Allison. If you can see that um, on your screen, this is a a book that I use uh, in my PhD course on ecclesiology, and I found it to be one of the most helpful books in my library on understanding and um, and developing a biblical ecclesiology. So uh, the information is going to come primarily from Allison. Um, you do not have that textbook, but if you want to get it, I would encourage you if you have a an extended interest in ecclesiology as a segment of systematic theology that you would get that book. I think it'd be very helpful. Um, Allison does a really good job of uh, backing up his arguments with uh, multiple scripture texts. Uh, does a really good job explaining things. It's a little wordy, but sometimes you have to be wordy uh, at the academic level. It's certainly not designed for just pleasure reading. It's designed for, for research, but I think that uh, if you want to pursue uh, ecclesiology, then that would be a helpful book for you. So um, don't forget uh, with these lectures, you know, they're going to be 40 minutes to an hour long, uh, about every 15 minutes. Uh, stop the lecture, um, stretch, move around a little bit uh, to make sure you uh, increase your ability to retain the information. So here we go. So today, uh, in this discussion of uh, the, the characteristics of the church. This is really an ontological discussion. Now, if you remember from previous courses in theology, that ontos is the Greek word that means being, uh, having to do with being. So these seven characteristics that we're going to discuss in just a second that Allison gives us are related to the, the being, the, the ontological nature of the church. So here are the seven characteristics as uh, given to us by Allison. Uh, and they all start with the phrase, the church is. So the church is doxological. And we'll explore that. The church is logocentric. We'll explore that in this lecture. The church is pneumodynamic. We will explore that in this lecture. Those are the three characteristics that we will focus on in this lecture. But Allison goes on to give four more. The church is covenantal. Uh, the church is gathered as members under the new covenant. Uh, in this covenant relationship uh, that, that we exist in as Christians and as members of the church, it is both a vertical uh, covenantal relationship with God and then a horizontal covenantal relationship with each other. So the church is covenantal. The church is confessional. Uh, the church is um, united by both its personal confession, confession in Jesus and also the historic confessions of the faith. And the church is eschatological. Um, the church possesses hope and a certainty that, uh, that there is a destiny uh, that each Christian has, that the church has. Even though we live in the here and now, uh, the church is eschatological and and is affixed to an eschatological hope. So those are the seven characteristics that Allison uh, describes in his book. And we're going to focus on the first three, which is that the church is doxological, uh, logocentric and pneumodynamic. So we'll, what do we mean when we say that the church is? Uh, doxological. Well, the word doxa in Greek means glory, right? So all of God's creation, the universe, the planets, the earth itself, all of God's creation is in a doxological orientation to God. The created universe is in a state of perpetual worship to God. Psalm 119 or Psalm 19 one says the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Psalm 108 five 
says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens and let your glory be over all the earth. So, so the universe, the created universe, stands in worship in a positionally, in, in its orientation, is worshiping God. The interesting things, the interesting thing about humans is that humans, because of the fall, are not naturally oriented doxologically to God. So humans are only doxologically oriented to God. And we'll, we'll explore this. I'll, I'll make sure you understand what I'm talking about. Humans are not doxologically oriented to God unless they place their faith in Jesus. So I'm not going to read them, but if you were to, to read in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapters 3 and chapters 4, um, one of the things that you can get from the chapter 3, which is um, Jesus' discourse with Nicodemus, in chapter 4, which is Jesus' discourse with the Samaritan woman at the well, uh, you, you get a better understanding of, of this concept um, that I'm, I'm trying to help you define. So let's look at uh, John chapter 3. In this discourse, Jesus built a case that only those regenerated by the Holy Spirit are qualified for the doxological organization. He says in John 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. So he establishes this notion in John chapter 3 that, 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 that right relationship with God centers around this idea of being born of the Spirit, right? We discussed this in depth in pneumatology. Um, I think most of you probably had to take pneumatology before you took this class. So if you can think back to some of your pneumatology lectures, um, you'll discover that, that we can only be in right relationship with God if we are born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a role to play. And then as you move to John chapter 4, you see Jesus in this interaction with the Samaritan woman, and he concludes his discourse with her by saying, but the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and and true. So these two discourses reveal that only those born of the Spirit and who possess a spirit nature are qualified as genuine worshipers of God. And are only that that's the only way you get to engage in authentic worship. So we're talking about the doxological orientation of the church to God. Doxa means glory. Um, we glorify God through worship, our, our lives, our speech, our actions. But according to John chapter 3 and 4, this worship of God, this bringing God glory, only occurs when one is born of the Spirit. So one must be born of the Spirit to be positionally in a right place to worship God. So that means... While the heavens declare the glory of God, while the universe screams the glory of God, humans, because of the fall, are not positionally in a place to worship God. You have to be born of the Spirit. So humans can only be placed in a doxological orientation to God after they've been born of the Spirit. For the Old Covenant... It had to be those that were under the old covenant, that were under the covenant of Moses. And so it's right to conclude then that the church as the assembly 
of those under the new covenant, born of the spirit and participants in the new covenant are characterized by the same reality. The church then joins the, the, the creation as a body doxologically oriented to God in a state of perpetual worship. So what that means is, is when Christians are born of the spirit, they become doxologically oriented to God. The church made up of those believers is doxologically oriented to God. So what that means is, as the universe cries out in worship to God, those born of the spirit join the voices of the universe and declare the glory of God in one beautifully loud, triumphant declaration that, that God is sovereign and supreme and that only comes from humans that only comes as a result of being born in the spirit. So when we talk about this idea of being doxologically oriented, I want to make sure that we don't, that we don't misunderstand what I mean. What we're really saying is that, is that for humans to be doxologically oriented to God, for the church to be doxologically oriented to God, then really, it must be orthodoxologically oriented to God. Ortho, um, in, in Greek, means proper. So that means that the church, the church has been called to bring proper worship to God. Right? So if, if the church is being called to, to bring proper glory to God, and that implies the possibility that the church can engage in false worship or idolatry. Now, we're not going to go through the Old Testament, but if you are familiar with the story of Israel and the struggle of that nation um, as it relates to their relationship with God, under the Old Covenant, the, the number of times the nation of Israel found themselves not orthodoxologically oriented to God. They were under the covenant. They understood the law, but they had become idolatrous. And because of their idolatry, even though they were circumcised, even though they, even though they were under the, under the Abrahamic covenant and under the Mosaic law, they found themselves unorthodox doxology, uh, doxologically oriented to God because of their idolatry. And you move to the New Testament, both Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 and John in 1 John uh, chapter 5 offer stern warnings for Christians to abstain and flee from idolatrous behaviors. So we conclude then that in order for the church to be doxologically oriented to God, it must be orthodoxologically oriented. And so the very first characteristic according to Allison, is that of all the things the church is, the church is doxologically or orthodoxologically oriented to God in true worship. The second characteristic Allison shares with us is, is that the church is logocentric. So at the beginning of John's gospel, the gospel of John, in the first couple of paragraphs, he introduces us to the Logos, the Logos, which was present with God at creation and was himself God and is the source of eternal life. Logos is a word that means word. So if you get your English Bible out and you read the, the first few words of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word Logos. And the word, Lagos, was with God. And the word, Lagos, was God. So you, you read that in verse 18. And the Lagos was with us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the Lagos, according to John, came, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, 
right? And his own people did not receive him. However, according to John, all those that did receive the Lagos, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So the Lagos, John makes it very clear. This is something that Orthodox Christianity affirms. There is really, guys, there's really no debate on this issue that that the Logos that John is talking about in the first chapter of his gospel is the eternal son of God, the God man, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, who is the visible revelation of the invisible God. So the Logos is the visible representation of the invisible God. And because Jesus is the Logos, and faith in Jesus is a requirement for entrance into the church. It stands to reason then that the church is centered on the word of God. In this case, the word of God being the logos. So the church is logocentric in that regard. Uh, uh, Jesus calls what he is building in Matthew chapter 16, my church It is, is his church. Um, if you look at some of the other imagery that's used in the New Testament, particularly with Paul, Paul uses a couple of different images to reflect that the church is ontologically identified with the Logos, which is Jesus, right? So Jesus calls it his, the church is mine, right? But then Paul uses some language to double down on that. He says uh, that 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 the the, the church is built on the foundation of the prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone. And then he uses uh, the terminology for, for the head. He says that the church is the, uh, Jesus is the head of the body, even the church. So, so Jesus is the head, literally the head, the brain of the church, the, the head of the church and the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the first stone that is put down to build a building, it's the if, if that stone is not even and not level and not uh, secure, then the, the rest of the building is not even and level and secure. So Jesus is the chief cornerstone and the head of the church. So the church is logocentric, logocentric because literally it is built on the life, the mission, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of the Logos, of Jesus, right? So the church is logocentric. All right, I'm going to shift my, um, my notes here. i got to find a better way to put my notes up because I don't like the way that I, I do it now. I always have to keep from covering the camera. All right, so the church is doxologically oriented towards God. The church is logocentric and uh, or logocentric in terms of the logos, but the church is also logocentric in terms of scripture. The saving grace of God is made known to us through the word of God. And because of this, the church is logocentric. The church is centered on the inspired word of God. Now, here's something that, that we need to understand about the word of God. And I think this is something that, that you should really be in a position to make sure that the members of your church understand, because I think this has caused a lot of problems, particularly in the 20th century, 20th and 21st century. So here's what the Christian church believes about the Bible, about the word of God. We believe that the original autographs, when Paul or John or Peter, or when Moses was writing the Pentateuch, or when Isaiah was writing, we believe that the original autographs are inspired authoritative, productive, inerrant, uh, 
right? That's what we believe. Those original documents that originally, if put together, make up the 66 books of the Bible, we believe that those original autographs are divinely inspired, are inerrant, and are productive. Translations, translating from the original text to another language, is based on the inspired, inerrant, and productive, authoritative word. But the translation itself is not. That's why it's very important that when we are translating the Bible, that we translate based on the most accurate documents that we have. Now, we don't have any of, of the original documents. They weren't written on paper. They're written on other things, papyri or, or you know, a, a scroll of some kind. They, they were not written on paper, and so they were subject to decay. And so in terms of the Old Testament, scribes were tasked with copying down scripture, like copying the Pentateuch, copying, you know, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, the, the prophets, right, the, the, the wisdom literature and the Psalms. So they were tasked with writing that down, and the scribes did a very good job. Uh, accuracy was, was the most important aspect of their job. So when it comes to the New Testament, we have copies of copies of copies. Now, we're not going to get into it. I can do another lecture if you guys want me to on why we believe that the Bible is accurate and why we can trust the translations that we have. That's, that's a different lecture. But you just have to trust for the purposes of this lecture that, that when you hold your Bible in your hand, your ESV, your NIV, your Revised Standard Version, your NASB, when you hold your English translation in your hand, it is based on the oldest, most accurate documents we have. And so sometimes we get caught up in uh, the translation that is the inspired word. And so the reason we don't say that the translation is the inspired word is because if the translation is not accurate, then the translation doesn't accurately af uh, reflect the original autographs. I'll use the, the New World Translation as an example. Uh, that's the Bible that the Jehovah's Witnesses use. That is a translation of the Bible. And it is so poorly translated that you can't even trust what you're reading. So the translation isn't what we consider to be the gold standard. It's the original autographs. So we don't have the original autographs. So we use the, 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 the number of and the accuracy of uh, the copies we have. And what you want for your translation whether you're translated into English or Portuguese or Mandarin, what you want in your translation is you want the, the oldest, most accurate documents that you have. Now, the very first lecture of most of my courses, I tell my students to make sure that they get a, a modern English translation of the Bible. And I try to encourage my students to not use the King James Version of the Bible. The King James Version is a good translation, but there's a couple of challenges with the King James. Number one, it's a good translation, but it's not the best translation we have. The reason it's not the best translation we have is because it's based on, it's based on documents, the oldest of which are right around the 10th century, right? a thousand years after the original authors uh, wrote their letters and their books, particularly the New Testament. The newer translations, NIV, NASB, ESV, some of those newer translations, 
are based on older, more accurate documents. That's why you will come across places in the King James that's translated differently than it is in modern English. Um, one of the, the most telling places where you find that, that I think is a good example, is in Acts when Paul is before Festus um, and he gives his speech um, in the King James. Um, I forget exactly how it's worded, but it says, Paul, thinkest thou can um, either convince me or convert me in such a short amount of time? Basically, Paul, do you think you can convince me in such a short amount of time? Right. And that's not really what it says in the English translation. And so, um, no, no, in the, I know what it is. I'm sorry. In the King James, it says, Paul, almost persuadest thou me to be a Christian. That's what it is. That's what it says in the King James, which would lead one to believe that that Festus was almost converted. But we've discovered that there are older, more accurate documents than those that were used to translate the King James, where what Festus actually says is, Paul, do you think you can convert me in such a short amount of time? Two completely different meanings. Now, there's not enough of those variations between ESV, NIV, and the King James uh, for me to say don't ever use a King James ever. But I would say that that um, what you want is you want the most accurate translation possible. And um, because the translation is not what's inerrant, it's the original documents. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is when it comes to um, infallibility and inerrancy, and you're looking for a translation. And this is, you know, above all of our pay grade, these are people, this is really related to people that translate for a living, is that when, when it comes to choosing a Bible translation, I think it's best to choose one that is focused more on accurately translating the words than one that tries to read well in English. And so um, that's why you see in, the, in my syllabi, for the most part, I list the ESV, the NIV, and the um, New American Standard as, as the, the translation you should probably, probably use. In my opinion, um, I think the New American Standard is probably the best translation we have. Not as many people use it, um, Coming out of college, I use the NIV, and I still use the NIV um, quite a bit. But at my church, my pastor uses the ESV, and so I'm trying to make a shift to that because that's that's the Bible I take to church and you know make notes in and things like that. But but back to our point that the church is logocentric as it relates to scripture. So the Word of God is the revelation from God is a is is one of the chief revelations from God you know, to the church. And it is the source for the church's understanding of the Trinitarian God. So we have two revelations, not just two, not just two, but we have two primary revelations. We have the revelation of God in Jesus, right? Jesus was the visible manifestation of the invisible God. He was, he was God, fully God in the flesh. Right. The second revelation we have is scripture. And what we get from scripture is we get that is our source for understanding the Trinitarian God, understanding the Father, Son and Spirit. So Paul tells Timothy that all scripture is breathed out by God. So remember um, in in the. Um, in the Greek, also in the Hebrew. Uh, the words for spirit are also the words for breath. So it's kind of a double meaning there. That all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3. And then Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, I won't read it, but he tells us that the Holy Spirit superintended, in other words, supervised the biblical authors as they composed their writings. So when you think about 
how scripture came to be like the individual letters. Peter sits down, he wants to write a letter. He starts writing and that letter that he's writing makes it into our canon, first or second Peter. Let's just use that as an example. So what we as a Christian church believe about the production of these letters, the production of these books, both in the Old and the New Testament, is that it was a process that involved both the human authors who constructed their narratives, their psalms, their letters, using their grammatical abilities, their choices of literary genre, their theological perspectives, and the Holy Spirit guided them in their work. And so you had this dynamic partnership between, between the people of God who wrote and the Holy Spirit of God who supervised the writing. And the outcome of this, this dynamic process was the actual inspired words of God that authoritatively provide teaching, wisdom, theological truth. Reproof is what Paul said to Timothy, which is highlighting of, of sinful attitudes, simple actions. Uh, the, the authority of the word of God corrects, trains in righteousness and aids in sanctification. Um, I've hid my word, I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Sanctify me by your truth. Your word is truth. So the church is logocentric because the church is of the divine logos and is of the written word of God. So in this way, the church is logocentric, doxological, logocentric, meaning both the logos of God and scripture, the written word of God. Now, the third characteristic we get from Allison is that the church is pneumodynamic, which isn't really a word, at least not as far as Microsoft Word is concerned, because everywhere in my notes, it's underlined as a misspelled word. But I understand what Allison is trying to say, and hopefully at the end of this lecture, you'll understand it as well. So the church is pneumodynamic. The church is created, gathered, gifted, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So the work of the Holy Spirit under the new covenant is much more pronounced and much more extensive than it was in the old covenant. And again, this is one of those things you need to look back in your pneumatology notes to see the differences between how the Spirit operated in the old and the new testament. But the new covenant activity of the Holy Spirit consists of several ministries. And all of these ministries of the Holy Spirit could be described as encompassing the entire breadth of a Christian's experience of salvation. The Spirit is involved in drawing the person. The Spirit is involved in conviction in regeneration, in sealing, in bearing witness, according to Paul in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 16, the, the Spirit is involved in bearing witness that the Christian belongs to God. The working of the Spirit continues through the lives of Christians, through sanctification and greater conformity to the image of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And through the Spirit, believers are able to exhibit the divine characteristics that Paul calls fruit. In Galatians chapter 5. And then finally, the, the work of the Spirit will find its culmination in the reality of the believer's glorification when that same Spirit who Paul says raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies in the eschaton. So the Holy Spirit is so intricately involved in the life of the believer from the moment of conviction all the way through every step of the salvation process through the life of the believer through un until the believer is glorified at the end of time with a new body that the spirit is involved in every aspect of that. And if the church, and the church is, by the way, if the church is 
composed of those blood-bought members of God's people who have accepted Jesus. And by virtue of me saying accepted Jesus, it's the same as saying led by the Spirit through conviction, regenerated by the Spirit, sanctified by the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit, uh, uh, transformed by the Spirit at the eschaton, that those people are what we call the church. And the Spirit is so intricately and dynamically involved in the the day-to-day, minute-to-minute life of the church that the church is pneumodynamic in almost every way. I hope that makes sense. That's a shorter um, version of that that Allison gives us. Allison gives a lot more uh, information than I'm giving you here. But um, the reason I only picked these three characteristics, and what are those three characteristics? The church is meant to glorify God. The church is doxological. The church is affixed to the divine logos and the inspired word of God, which is to say the church is logocentric. And the church is born of, led by, and transformed by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the church is pneuma dynamic. Now, the reason I only focused on these three rather than all seven is because um, you have a lot to learn this semester. And I want to make sure that we leave a little bit for you to explore on your own as uh, you write your papers. And that's the other reason that I gave you Allison uh, as a resource. Uh, If you want to look it up in the library or uh, purchase a copy uh, for your papers, um, I've given you at least a starting point uh, for Allison. But I think these three encapsulate the, the bulk of the characteristics of the church. Um, certainly, as the church defines itself in relationship to God, uh, those three are, in my opinion, the the, the most um, the most theologically necessary, because the other characteristics I believe flow from these three. So that is three of the seven characteristics of the church, as given by uh, Greg Allison. I hope that. Uh, You got something out of this. As always, students, um, let me know if you have questions or concerns. Uh, Send me a text message or an email. Uh, Thanks for uh, joining the lecture, and I'll see you next time.